This is the Story Punks podcast, a show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. I'm your host, Cindy Grigg. This is episode eight. Such an exciting one for me as someone who is writing Manor Punk, because I'm interviewing Mary Robinette Kowal about Manor Punk also known as Fantasy of Manners. Mary has a Regency era series called The Glamorous Histories that combines Jane Austen times and magic. Yup, awesome. She writes wonderful things like this. She articulates life and the universe like few can. She teaches, she podcasts, she puppeteers. She's wonderful. Plus, at the end of this interview, she shows us some of her vintage typewriter collection. Mm Mm-hmm, so good. And did I mention that Mary Robinette Kowal also narrates audiobooks? She's actually narrated this Manor Punk series we'll be talking about today. You can find The Glamorous Histories on Audible. And on that note, Audible is sponsoring this episode of the Story Punks podcast. It was inevitable because if you've listened to even one or two episodes of this podcast, you know that I read through my ears these days. And I think it's because by the time I spend all day creating, editing and working on a screen, the last thing I want to do is look at a page of words or even a digital screen. And even though I've enjoyed reading throughout my life, I've just hit this point where I definitely need to mix it up. And it's allowed me to keep reading and to keep preparing for these these interviews that I do with so many different authors and to understand their work, to read their work. So it's an investment in my health because instead of sitting around, I'm out on the trail or I'm on a treadmill moving my body. I know, amazing concept in this day and age, right? And I have a deal for you at storypunks.world forward slash audible. Click through there and you can make Mary's first book in this series. So it's called Shades of Milk and Honey first book in the Glamorous Histories series, you can make that your free complimentary book. So you can try this for absolutely free. And Mary performs it so well. I've absolutely loved it. I've loved going on some early winter hikes while listening to this amazing story. So go ahead and take a turn about the room or your gym or your city and just listen to the series we're discussing in today's interview. So once again, that's storypunks.world forward slash audible. And without further ado, let's get into this interview. Today, we are welcoming Mary Robinette Kowal. I'm so excited to have her on the Story Punks podcast. Mary Robinette Kowal is the author of historical fantasy novels, the Glamorous History series, and Ghost Talkers. She has received the Campbell Award for Best New Writer, three Hugo Awards, the RT Reviews Award for Best Fantasy Novel, and has been a finalist for the Hugo, Nebula, and Locus Awards. Stories have appeared in Strange Horizons, Asimov's several years best anthologies, and her collections Word Puppets, and Scenting the Dark and Other Stories. As a professional puppeteer and voice actor, through SAG and AFTRA, Mary has performed for Lazy Town CBS, the Center for Puppetry Arts, Jim Henson Pictures, and founded Other Hand Productions. Her designs have garnered two Unima USA Citations of Excellence, the highest award an American puppeteer can achieve. It's just so cool. She records fiction for authors such as Cage Baker, Cory Doctorow, and John Scalzi. Mary lives in Chicago with her husband, Rob, and over a dozen manual typewriters. So please visit maryrobinettkowal.com. On her website, she has this amazing resource that I want to mention right away so that I don't forget. She has a list of articles that you can check out if you are a debut author and such amazing advice for all of us to digest as creators, but we'll be talking about her works of fiction and all the amazing projects she's involved in. I welcome you onto the show, Mary. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Absolutely. We'll start off with this question. The word manor punk gets different reactions from different people. It's not one of the biggest punks. And I would just love to get Mary's take on the term. So I find the term really uh, interesting because I it, it's the the thing for me about punk is that that you're talking about taking something and and hacking it in some way. 
Um, and the thing that I love about the idea of manner punk is that it's not, is, is thinking of manners as a technology, which they are, they're a social technology. So I love the idea of, of that. And it, it, for me, it revolves around the, the periods of time that we tend to think of as the most mannered, which is the Regency and, and the Romantic era, which is, or, or early Victorian, depending on how you want to call it. But where the emphasis is on um, tweaking the societal structures more so than tweaking the, uh, the, tech, the, the you know, gears and steams. That is such a beautiful description. And I've never heard it described as the manners being a technology, but it coincides with some of the things I've seen where manners are used as a weapon. And so. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. If you've read any Jane Austen novels at all, they are, manners are definitely a weapon. One of the things, uh, let me give a, a really fast example of, of an, uh, manners as technology, uh, or, or social engineering is really what we're talking about. But in the Regency, um, if a gentleman wanted to meet a lady, he had to be introduced to her by someone who knew them both. He couldn't just walk up and introduce himself at a dance. And so what this, this tiny social detail does is that it immediately creates a whisper network. It does, and, it does. Yeah. And so you, you can't be introduced to a CAD in, in theory. Um, in, in practice, you know, whisper networks also fail. But, uh, but it, it's fascinating that that was actually a thing that was encoded into the society rather than the, the informal thing that we have in, in the modern world. So that's the kind of thing that I, I like to play with. Yes, that's so awesome. Thank magic, you. But, you know. <laughs> and yeah, there's this thing of magic too. I love, so I, I hope I don't butcher this, but I've seen Mary's work. I, I believe it was you that said, the the glamorous histories are mm -hmm. basically if Jane Austen had written and if she had had magic in her mm -hmm. world and you also have this other book called Ghost Talkers now mm -hmm. that is set in a time period that could be considered the diesel punk period but is it diesel punk i don't think it is only because i am not messing around with technology ghost punk however totally ghost punk because i'm using spiritualism as a technology and hacking the heck out of it. Okay, that's that's awesome. So we'll be talking more about both of these works, so the the series as well as Ghost Talkers. And then Mary, I'm so excited for your Lady Astronaut uh, series that's coming out next year. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so space punk, I guess, <laughs> or atom punk. <laughs> yes, or Mercury punk. I'm not sure. Um, so this is uh, these are. A, a duology of um, early science fiction or historical science fiction, alternate history, whatever you want to call it. They're set in, the first one is set in 1952 and begins about two minutes before an asteroid slams into the Chesapeake Bay, mostly obliterating, uh, taking out DC and most of the East Coast, um, which kicks off a global initiative to get off the planet. Um, as as one would have an imperative to do. It's like, no, maybe we should spread around a little bit. Um, so uh, so that's book one. And, and the thing that is fun about it for me um, is that it's, uh, because it's set in the early 1950s, this is at the point before we have mechanical computers when the computers are still women. Um, so if you've seen Hidden Figures, uh, this is much like that, but actually predates a little bit. So there's, there's no IBM coming in at any point. It's just all, all women mathematicians all the time. Um, but it's also right after World War II, where we have a ton of WASPs, which were the women air service uh, pilots. And so you've got a bunch of highly trained pilots who are also mathematicians and they make very natural candidates for astronauts if they can get past, oh, misogyny and the patriarchy, you know. Um, but it's also during the civil rights movement as well. So uh, we also have the, can we get people into space who are not just white? Um, and and the, all of those kind of societal pressures combining with the environmental pressures of the earth heating up because of the asteroid strike. Um, and, and then 
Mercury era technology getting us into space. So this could be also classified as eco-punk, possibly. Oh, yeah, yeah, potentially. <laughs> potentially. There's so many punks, yeah. Yeah, so many punks, not enough time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's talk about this class that you have coming up. It's a course that I noticed Mary is offering online. And for those watching or listening, at the time of this recording, there was a world building class coming up. So the offerings may be different depending on when you are hearing this or watching it. So just know that you can go to maryrobinettekoal.com. That's where you can sign up for her newsletter, which is the best way to be notified about her other classes, as well as beta reading opportunities and other goodies. And you can also go to her Patreon page. If you are one of her patrons, you have access to additional resources, which is so awesome. We're talking about history. So we're world, we're, whoa, we're world building in that time period, but we're punking it. So how have you approached it in all these historical works that you've just told us about? Cool. Uh, it's, it's very much the same way that, I mean, Welcome to my class. Um, <laughs> so the, the thing is that world building works uh, along very similar lines, whether you're looking at the far future, whether you're looking actually at contemporary world, or whether you're looking at fantasy, secondary world, or, or the past when you're hacking it, which is that anytime you make a change, you have to think about, uh, I think, three basic questions, which is um, why the change occurred, um, how it, which is, so that's looking at the past, at, at things prior to the change. Uh, then you look at how, which is how that change is manifesting in the present. And then you look at with what consequence, which is, is how it's going to unfold as you move forward. So, um, so for instance, with the glamorous histories, the, the change that I made was that there's magic. Uh, it's called glamour hence the title Glamorous Histories. Um, and, and it's basically a, uh, it's an illusionary form of magic. You can paint with light and sound, um, but it's not, uh, it's not like I can create a candle right here. It's I can create the illusion of a candle with the illusion of light, but not actual light. And one of the, one of the reasons that I have that particular thing specified with, you know, not actual light was because of that series of questions. Because if you can create light with your hands and manipulating things, why would anyone have ever developed candles? Right. So, so that's, you know, that's one of those things. It's like, oh, wait a second. Why do we have candles? Uh, there's no reason we would have candles. So therefore I have to pull that out. It, it cannot create actual light, just the illusion of light. Um, so it's that sort of thing going back and forth. Um, I, I wanted, I also wanted, um, because I was doing Jane Austen with magic, my main character uh, therefore needed to be a young lady of quality. And young ladies of quality didn't have jobs, but I also wanted her to work with magic. Therefore, that meant that, you know, well, why would she work with magic? Because it's totally impractical. You know, that's, that's why a young lady of quality. And also, it's, it's decorative. She learns it the same way she learns music and dance and, and embroidery because it's always being, uh, you know, pursuing the feminine arts. And, um, and so that's the kind of, of thing that I'm, I'm doing. I'm, I'm taking sort of existing social structures and figuring out how the magic fits into those without like just breaking the structures. So th one of the things that I, I do is, is kind of like the way people handle time travel, which is that um, the same battles took place, but things just went down slightly differently. Um, so, you know, like William the Conqueror came over uh, the, the way he did, but one of the reasons that he was able to to do the conquering of England was because French magic was more developed than than English magic. And, uh, and then he also made a deal with, uh, with the fairies, um, which is kind of actually hinted at a little bit. There's this woman that he, he forms an alliance with who's, you read the descriptions and you're like, oh, she's totally a fairy. She's 100% a fairy. Um, so so it's, it's 
you know, it's still the same history. It just happens slightly differently. And it sounds like you have history that you've figured out off the page that's not <laughs> directly called out on the page. Obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have worked out the timeline going back, not, not in hard concrete details, but just kind of big signposty things. Um, I figured out how, in, in again, big signposty things, how glamour works in other parts of the world, because um, you know it's it's an art form and art is not handled the same in every part of the, the planet. So um, so tried to figure that out, and then kind of where the future of it lies in part, so that I know the speed with which to uh, create new technologies. One of the things that bothers me. Um, sometimes when I'm seeing people do this kind of thing is that they will, they will introduce new technology, a lot of new technology very rapidly within the course of a book. Um, but that's not generally how scientific progress moves. And so I, I try to, uh, figure out how things, uh, unpack as, as we go. Like there was in one of the books, um, I was having them create something. I was like, wait, that actually would introduce the telephone in 1811. Mm, I think I'm not going to do that. Not going to do that. That would that would be a huge disruptor to right. work in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm going to wait on that one. So making those choices is a lot of what world building is about. Yeah. And this leads, so you mentioned how the technology of magic is different in different parts of the world or art is different in different parts mm-hmm. of the world. And that leads into a question about diversity. So I'd love to hear more about this wonderful tweet that Mary has pinned to the top of her Twitter feed. So go check out her Twitter feed. Um, she's tons of fun to follow, by the way. So you will be very entertained. And this, this tweet reads, it's not about adding diversity for the sake of diversity. It's about subtracting homogeneity for the sake of realism. What would you say to those who might say, well, actually, I'm writing about a time period that was very homogenous. So if I take out the hom- homogeneity, then it is actually less real. Well, I get this a lot, actually, in my Twitter feed in response to that tweet. Um, and uh, if I'm not feeling polite, uh, then I just, I, there's some curse uh, Latin responses. Um, but the the big thing is that when, when people are, are doing that, it it betrays a lot about the person who asks that question because it, it betrays exactly how they are defining diversity in their head. Um, that's thing one. Uh, there, there isn't anywhere in the planet uh, a completely homogeneous, not in the ways that we experience it frequently in, in fiction and, and in early career unpublished fiction. Um, but even like, even even published fiction, you see this. Uh, there, it's very rare that you see a group that is all exactly the same age, the same gender, uh, the same uh, religion, the same ability level, the same neurotypicality, uh, the same orientation sexually, and uh, where they are on the binary spectrum, the, the non-binary gender spectrum, um, and and race. That's incredibly rare. And the fact is that. Anything that you come up with, any time period that you name, I can point out um, historical examples where you, the person asking that question is just flat wrong. Um, it's like, as, a, as an example, uh, this is a place that I failed because I, I had the same exact thought, uh, which, uh, you know, shades of milk and honey. I'm like, well, it's set in a small English town. So obviously... You know, unfortunately, it's all white people all the time. I would love to say that I actually thought about this question before I wrote it, and I didn't. I just defaulted because that's the way I see Jane Austen. But when I began researching for later books, I realized that there were people of color throughout the British Isles. Um, and and we had, there were actually Black Roman centurions coming into Scotland, you know, like... Yeah, during the Roman Empire, it's like this is you know, um, and and because of because of the slave trade, uh, there were a lot of people who were brought to England and just stayed. Peter Bruegel. Um, so in in uh, in my second book, I was like, oh, I would like I would like people of color, but I'm setting it in a small town in Belgium. 
uh, in, in 1816 or 1815. Uh, so I can't, um, except that Peter Bruegel was uh, doing etchings of black peasants in the 1500s. And I'm like, well, I'm wrong because those are not people in court. Those are people in the countryside. I'm just flat wrong, just wrong. Um, so it's that kind of thing. It's like, no matter which axes of power you look at, uh, whether it's, it's uh, race or, or gender or anything, you will, find, uh, you will find examples. So then the question is, as an author, why are you choosing to deliberately set something in a place with, with uh, an almost unnatural form of, of humanity? Because it, it's not... Like when you when you start looking at at trade routes and things like that, the yes, there are places where someone could go their entire life without seeing anyone other than people that they were related to. Um, why are you putting your novel there? I mean, you can um, if you're writing epic fantasy. I I, I question your choices, um, and. And so that's that's basically what I would say is first, uh, nothing is homogeneous, uh, and second, you as an author are making choices about where you put things, and there's plenty of historical examples of small towns with diverse populations. That's wonderful. I think it's really refreshing that you admit that you went on a, a journey of realizing this or oh, this yeah. as you are researching and we all as authors have a way that we can subtract in order to be yeah. more realistic yeah i mean that's the thing is that there's so much of writing and, and just life in general where we've been programmed by the media that we consume like you know when i watch the jane austen or, or anything from the regency um it's created by people who absorbed material um, and they don't think about it either. It's it's all the stuff that we just don't question. I mean, Jane Austen was writing novels with people of color in it. Why wouldn't I? That's it's like it's it's a little bit, you know, Sanditon, which is her, the the novel she was working on when she died. The the most eligible young lady in town was a, a woman from the West Indies. You know, and and clearly mixed race. She's although the term is not in use today, but she's, you know, she's a mulatto and that's the way Austin calls her. And, and she's the most eligible young lady. So why the heck as a modern writer, would I not, you know, would I, I cater to the stuff that I've inherited that has been applied to her era, which is, you know, like all of, all of this stuff has been added. All of this homogeneity has been added. That just wasn't the way it was. Thank you so much. Okay, so from puppetry to print books to audiobook narrations, your storytelling crosses many forms. So how do story generation and story performance live together for you? Are, are you having to navigate that pairing or has it just become very natural? Um, it's an interesting question and, and different from the way most people phrase it. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> The, one of the things that I find is that uh, story creation, puppet design, um, those use the same part of my brain and performance uses a different part of my brain. So in one of them, uh, when I'm trying to create a story to write, uh, what I'm doing is I'm answering a bunch of questions um, and I'm trying to fit puzzle pieces together. So it's, it's very much about problem solving. Um, in addition to, uh, you know, there's this art that I would like to do Whereas with performance, the only, I shouldn't say the only thing, the, the primary thing that is taking place is, um, is about the interaction with the audience and the attempt to manipulate the audience's emotions. But the problems have been solved prior to engaging in that. So at that point, it's just about, about that back and forth. Whereas writing, um, although it, it involves that back and forth with the audience, I know that it's going to take that no one's going to read it for quite a while. So writing is much like um, kind of being in rehearsals 
uh, where I get to do something over and over again and apply a bunch of different techniques. And it's like, well, maybe we need this scenery. And uh, what are we going to do with this lighting cue? And where is my blocking? Um, in, until we get something that that feels correct for you know for achieving the effect that we want. Um, and then narration, even though I'm recording it, um, it's still there's a much more immediate connection to the audience. Uh, so that that for me is kind of the the difference between the two forms. But the the similarity is that it is all about uh, that communication and, and shaping of audience reaction. Um, so coming out of theater into writing, one of the things that uh, that I already knew was um, how audiences react. Like I, I know that it is much more effective, for instance, for me to have a character who is trying not to cry than to have a character who is crying. Because one of the things that will happen with a, an audience is that as soon as a character starts crying on stage, you are witnessing the crying. When they are trying not to cry, you will have a cathartic release of tears yourself in order to cry for them. Oh, that's and, interesting. Yeah, it's really fascinating. It's this very interesting um, bit of, of brain hacking. Uh, so I, I know that it's, it's way more effective most of the time for me to um, to have a character who is trying not to cry than, than a character who is actively crying as, as my POV character. Uh, if my POV character is witnessing someone crying, that's a different thing because then my point of view character and my reader are sitting in the same emotional place, um, which is, I just want you to stop crying. Let me comfort you. That is so interesting. Lots to think about on that one. And it's so cool to see how one form of art has influenced another. And yes, we don't have to only be writers, right? And we have all kinds of people listening to this. So whether you're a maker or you are a writer or you're a musician, it can be really expansive to delve into other forms of art. Yeah. Mary, can, I, can I briefly just address people who are makers? Yes. So one of the things besides the, the puppetry, but one of the, the kind of side steps to that was that I, I used to be, um, I used to do props when I was living in New York. And, and so one of the things that people often forget is that props uh, carry stories. A lot of times it's like, how can I make this thing really cool? But when you're trying to buy something, uh, you know, to, to furnish a character's home, there's a reason that that character got each of those items. Um, and, and each of those items tells you something about the character. And so when I, sometimes when I look at makers, um, I'm like, that looks really cool, but does it articulate anything about the character? Does it articulate anything about the society or is it just this looks awesome. And there is a place and time for this looks awesome and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that, that again, one should be making a choice about, uh, about why they're, why, I, I think actually just one should be making choices and, and approaching art consciously um, at, at some point in the process. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> a missed opportunity if you're yeah. not doing that. Yeah. So well said. So last question. Now, Mary collects typewriters. Do you, it sounds like you write with your typewriters from time to time. Yeah. Um, each form that you write with affects the way and the rhythms with which you write. So um, like there are parts of uh, Without a Summer, which I actually wrote with a, a real quill, like an actual feather. Because I was like, if Jane Austen could do it, uh, not, not the entire book by any stretch, there's a, there's a scene. Um, and first of all, I was surprised. I was like, oh, this is much easier than I thought it was going to be. Uh, you get about four lines of text per dip. So, but the thing that happens is that every time you go to dip the pen and then wipe it off, um, you are composing during that time. And because you're writing slower than you can think, uh, that you're also composing before the words hit the page. So I found that my sentence structures tended to get much longer. Um, my grasp of the overall scene structure 
kind of uh, was harder to maintain because it wasn't as easy to read back through it, what I had already written. So there was more sort of repetition, uh, which was interesting. Um, Longhand, again, I find that I'm more likely to insert things randomly. Typewriters, because there's really only forward progress. Um, I don't go back and make changes as much. I can go almost as fast as I'm thinking, not quite. But every time I do a, a carriage return, which is, you know, you have to manually return the, the carriage at the end of the line, there's a little bit of composition that happens. And then again, at the end of each page. So it, it fundamentally changes the rhythm with which I am writing. I've heard that Henry James could only write to the sound of a Remington, which I've, I don't know why that stuck with me, but yeah. Do you have a favorite sounding typewriter or is there a better criteria? Um, I don't have a favorite one, a favorite sound, um, but they do have different uh, action. Um, the, the way the, the key hits the paper. Um, so I have a, um, like I have a, a Corona number three, uh, which is probably my favorite typewriter, although that is probably my favorite because of aesthetic reasons. It is um, it is green and it folds and it's tiny and it's what Hemingway wrote on. Um, but I also have a, a Smith Corona um, uh, silent writer, which is probably my favorite one to type on because the action is so smooth. There's no effort. Um, it doesn't tend to lock up very often. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, it's tricky when you have 19 of them. It's like, which is your favorite child? Like, <laughs> I love my Bennett and it's terrible to type on, but it's such an odd machine. And my Blickendurfer, which has a non-QWERTY keyboard and is from the 1890s. Wow. Yeah, it's really cool. And it has a rotary head. Uh, so it predates the IBM Selectric by like 70 years with the same type of rotary head. It's amazing. Can't type on it at all. Not even a little bit. <laughs> so the layout, was it the Dvorak? I don't know if you've heard of that, but is yeah. it like... So here's... Okay. So let's talk about... We're nerd out here. We're totally about to nerd out. Um, so artifacts and uh, backstory and all of that. So the QWERTY keyboard. Once upon a time, every typewriter had its own unique keyboard layout. Every typewriter manufacturer... <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. No, that's awesome. That was, uh, that was my phone. Um, uh, so everyone had a, a unique layout. This was basically the operating system. And the goal with the typewriter manufacturers was to get people locked into that, that form so that when they tried to go to a different typewriter, it's like, oh, I have to relearn it all over again. I can't type as fast. So that you would stay in this thing. So then this guy comes along who, uh, who has the QWERTY and the story that he puts out is that he has worked with his son who is a super in, or his son-in-law who is superintendent of the school system to come up with this, this scientific keyboard that would not, the, the letters would not lock, um, lock up because they separated letter pairs. And, and you're yeah. talking about how the arm, the, it comes up right. and strikes the page and they would jam. Yeah. Right, correct. Um, the problem with this is if you take a moment to look at your keyboard, ER are right next to each other. That's a, that's a really common letter pair. It's a really common letter pair. Um, GH are right next to each other, which is another really common letter pair. There is an also an interesting thing that the letters to write the word typewriter are all on the top row. So basically, he, he came up with this story, which is not at all true. Uh, there were lists of common letter pairs, which, you know, are not, he, you know, AS, again, right next to each other. This is, the common letter pairs are just kind of right, a lot of them are just all right there. You're, you're all staring, staring at your keyboards yeah. now. Um, so this was just, this was just publicity. But the story was so good. The narrative was so good that people bought it. And other typewriter manufacturers started adopting his keyboard structure in order to have this scientific keyboard that wasn't going to lock up as easily as other keyboards did, therefore uh, allowing people to 
and type more smoothly and also um, you know, slowing down type is just a tiny bit so that, that again, keys wouldn't lock up. So it's, it's completely false. There's no truth in it at all. But this is, and this is, uh, I think, a really good example of why narrative is so important. Because if you put something in story form, um, you can lie to people and they will just believe you. You can also put things that are true in story form and people will believe it much more readily, which is, it's like, it's a really powerful thing. But but um, that is, uh, there's some typewriter punk for you. <laughs> yeah, I almost, because the typewriters are just right there. Yeah. Um, Should uh, we give a shot? That would be okay. awesome. All right. So for those listening to the podcast, if you'd like to see it, remember, just head to storypunks.world or you can go right to YouTube. Okay. Um, so we're going to take a quick, uh, quick move through my apartment. I'll s- try to stay centered so that I can introduce you to some of my typewriters. So, uh, so this is the Smith Corona Sterling. Uh, this is a very comfortable typewriter to, to work on. This is my Blickendurfer. So it just kind of looks like a spider, right? Yeah. Um, and when you, you see the, the print head there, that thing that's moving yes is rotating and the keys are 100 percent not a qwerty layout oh, they're so uh, cool isn't that awesome um and over here this is my uh corona special uh so remember i said that it folds yes Oops. trying to do this and hold the computer at the same time you're doing awesomely <laughs> This is my puppetry skill coming in because I'm watching the monitor. Um, oh, we use it as a charging station sometimes too. Um, but I just, it's such, a, it's such a sweet little machine. And then I also mentioned, um, I also mentioned the Bennett. So here we are coming down to look at the Bennett. The thing that's great about this one is see how tiny that is? It's look so at this. Small. It's so petite. It's like connecting to all the writers that came before us. Thank you again for being here, Mary. We have just nerded out together and I was already a fan, but this was just wonderful. So thank you. Will you please let everyone know where they can go for your work or to take advantage of some of those resources I already mentioned. So like the debut author lessons, where can they go to find you? Sure. The, the kind of big compository of everything is uh, if you put my entire very long name together, Mary Robin at Um It has a list, you know, it's got my bibliography there, including a, a free fiction bibliography, which is just places where I have stories that are for free. So if you want to give me a try and don't want to plunk down money, there are options. Um, and then um, uh, I also have a list there of, as you say, debut author lessons. There's a calendar that tells you where I'm going to be and what classes I have coming up. So yeah, that's probably the best place to go. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Thank day. You. you too. I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. And again, if you're interested in jumping in with audiobooks go to storypunks.world forward slash audible to get a great deal and you can make your first free book shades of milk and honey by mary robinette koal again it's wonderful to have you here and please visit storypunks.world to learn more and to get involved